Dear ADD Poker, I still remember the day that we met. Money flying over the tables, usually in my favor. My bankroll kept on growing and growing as you, 888, allowed me to move through the stakes all the way up to 5100 push fold, where I was able to gamble it up. Of all the sides that I played on 888 poker, you were always my favorite. But lately, I've started to feel this mutual love fading as you forced me to deposit over and over again and I'm starting to get the feeling that I'm the only one putting an effort into this relationship I've responded to your messages insufficient funds please deposit I've spoken your love languages by raking my ass off and what do I get in return gold coins and a one dollar blast I feel like the time has come for you to speak my love language again, which is a more equal card distribution among the players. And if you really still love me, even in my favor. So it's up to you now. Do you love me for playing on your side? Or is it only my credit card that you're interested in? Hi there boys and girls and welcome back to another video here at the Poker Ambition channel. It's time for a monthly recap. Given the many deposits that I had to make at 888 Poker over the last two months and the overall card distribution of which I clearly felt that it wasn't in my way on all sides, so nothing personal towards 888 here. I decided to dive into my database and do some analysis and I was actually pleasantly surprised with what I saw. So we met our goal for 15k hands a month. Last month I think we played 10k hands and this month we played 20k hands. The average stake will still need to go up in order to reach our goals. But like I said, we weren't running that bad. I also didn't think I played great. So usually not conditions in which you should be taking a lot of shots. But breaking down these last two months, we played 728 hands of heads up poker in which I somehow managed to lose 7.5k, which is quite weird because the only times I actually play heads up is when a six max table breaks and we exchange the button or it's in the case where a fish suddenly joins me and he wants to play a couple of hands heads up and it takes a couple of hands before other regulars join the table. Now I do remember that there were two hands where I think we exchanged buttons and I managed to lose two stacks. Surprisingly, this was on 888 poker. One of them was actually quite interesting. So this was actually the first one. I called a tribute with ace nine, flop two pair. And basically, yeah, he check jammed the turn. He had ace king. So that was quite unfortunate. And then the hand after that, we get dealt pocket sevens. We call on the big blind. We flop a set, happy life, we play it fast. And we actually face a three bet on the flop, which, you know, is pretty interesting. We can actually take a look at a solver to see if this would be a thing. So we check towards the small blind. I wanted to say button, but obviously we're playing heads up. See if it's one third. I would say we have probably have a mandatory race somewhere. On the bigger side, I think it went three quarters. Looks like pot is more of a preferred sizing. We should actually three bet this hand most of the time pre-flop. Uh, so we went for the check raise. Okay, I'll click pot. And in position should do no three betting whatsoever. So we'll see versus smaller sizing. Also not really a lot of three betting. I think a hand made sense would be like third pair. Let me see. Second pair, third pair. 
So yeah, like a 7-9, like a king 7, an a7, something that blocks some value. And let's say we have a hand like jack 8 that has quite a lot of equity versus a hand like a7. So I think a7 was one of the hands that I thought he could find um, to take this 3-bet line with. But basically we're going in a line that is going to be very uncommon and not really theoretically approved. Obviously it happens a low frequency, but, but I would say most people then find this play too often. So now it's up to us. I decide to call. The turn is an eight and I actually now decided to do something funky. I actually decided to lead. Um, I think an eight in general should improve my range. I don't think he should really three bet the flop with a hand like jack nine as he doesn't want to three bet and me jamming in pocket sevens and that he has to fold. So jack nine is definitely a hand that we can have in our range. Um, I guess queen eight we could sometimes have in our range. I guess six nine suited we could have in our range. So I thought that the eight would be a range improvement card for me. Let's say we did have a hand like queen jack. That hand now improves. And I just did not really want him to be able to pot control. I figured that we should not be going in check call mode twice and give him the opportunity to maybe pot control at a certain street. Let's say he did three bet, he three betted the flop with a hand like pocket kings, king, queen, ace, queen, stuff like that. So I actually decided to come out with a lead. Bluff obviously is also way less likely because we have two sevens. Let's say I had queen 10, I would never lead the turn because then I think he just has too many seven X that he could have as a bluff. And we block a lot of the hands that we are, in this case with pocket sevens, leading into that to prevent them from pot controlling. Now, river is a great card. I jam and obviously now we should mainly have the best hand. However, he had pocket queens, which is... I would say probably the last hand that I would want to three bet the flop with, okay? So these were two hands that obviously when you're in a downswing and you're just playing two buttons to close the table can definitely irritate you, especially given the way he played his hand. Now roughly 25% of my volume was played three to four handed, which usually means that there's no recreational player at the tables. It's just Rex battling it out. It went quite well on 1K. However, as we can see here, we Sli we ended up slightly losing and money wise we ended up losing quite a bit and this is because the small sample that i played on 2k we ran quite bad mainly in pre-flop all wins obviously you know you could say that on 2k there's a couple of lineups where the opposition is going to be a little bit tougher but not minus 65 bb tougher i think that was around the win rate i was winning at 2k three to four handed but I would mainly also say that it were mainly the same players that I was playing against. If it was a lineup where there's only guys who play 2K+, plus, I would have probably gotten out of the way unless I really felt like playing. And then obviously the rest of the volume is played five to six handed, which are gonna be most of your volume. And in that actually we did quite well with the EVBB 100 of seven BB. In some other analysis, I also found out that basically going all in is not really working out for me these win rates here as you can see already in all in ev you can already see the variance but in general even if vbb 100 preflop all wins you're supposed to win way more money now i looked at my stack off there was one hand that was quite dubious but all around i would say in preflop all in situations over the last two months the card distribution has not been in my favor and as i mentioned i often saw this happening at 2k in the three and four handed games also, investing in 4-bet pots did not go my way. Usually not a great indicator of success. If you invest in 4-bet pots, you usually want to win it. And as you can see here, my win rates are quite low. The average win rate should be way higher. So this is again an example of how I look at variance in my game, other than just all in EV. And I do actually also remember getting tired of 4-betting Pocket Kings, Ace in the flop, Pocket Kings, Ace in the flop, Pocket Kings, Ace in the flop. I actually looked, it happened like five times, which is obviously quite frustrating. Also, when I called four bets, I did manage to make a couple of strong hands or when I had jacks and the board came nicely 10 high, obviously the other guy just had Kings. So in general, in the bigger pots, things were just not going in my favor. Nothing we can really do about it. And then there were some other scenarios that also, again, you don't really see if you just look at all in EV. And even if you do more filtering, it's quite hard to spot out this variance. 
but I notice a lot of worst case scenarios happening. I make a strong hand, I raise the river, nine out of 10 times, you know, he's just gonna call me win a lot of money, and then one out of 10 times he's gonna jam, and I recall many times that I had to raise fold or raise call very strong hands, where basically I ran into an even stronger hand. So a lot of these situations where just the EV of being in a scenario is quite high, but there is maybe a 5% or 10% chance that you're actually going to end up being indifferent. Those scenarios happened quite frequently, unfortunately, which is not really something that you will see back in ONEV or even in the filters that I'm running. Now, if you guys want to learn more about how to filter your game for variance so you can stay mentally sane in the head, or in general, if you guys want to understand how to pluck your games for leaks, these are things that I explain in our Mechanics of Poker program. Link down below in the description. As mentioned, I think in the last video where I kind of explained what I do on a monthly basis, I also mentioned that I take a look at my stats. So I took a look at my stats for last month and we had a couple of goals where we mainly wanted to be more aggressive in some pre-flop spots. Now, in most scenarios that worked, I remember my button three bet went up a little bit, my four bet percentages went up a little bit, but there's this one spot that I just cannot seem to get up, okay? Usually I don't have any trouble getting it up, but when it comes down to squeeze percentage, it's been hunting me throughout my career that I just cannot get that percentage up. So again, I'm gonna try to focus on it. Um, looked at the ranges, I've made filters to look at it after my session, but I just keep on missing the spots. Even though I actually noticed in game, like, hey, this is actually one of these spots, and I did feel like I grabbed on more squeeze opportunities, stats-wise, it still showed that I was still not reaching an optimal percentage in that spot. Now, as I mentioned, I was a little bit surprised when I saw my results. I thought we were doing way worse. However, you know, an EV BB of four and an actual BB of one in three to six handed games is quite decent. Do think there's room for improvement, but it's not as bad as I thought things were going. Now, I don't think I handled the, if we can call it downswing that well. I noticed there were quite some mistakes that I was making due to the fact that I was in a bit of a pessimistic mindset. There were decisions that I made which were influenced by, I would say, fear of losing. And I actually wanted to share a couple of hands with you guys where this came up. So I'm going to use this hand as the main example. We open king, queen offsuit on the button, flop comes queen, jack four. Two tone, I decide to overbat. Villain calls, turn is an eight. He checks, I check behind, and the river is a queen, and he now blocks, and we call. We should raise the river. I think as played, the rest of the hand is fine. So yeah, he showed ace jack, and I thought this hand was really interesting from a mental game perspective, and I will now show you guys why. Now, rationally speaking, I understand what's going on, and I would spot it in game and try to override it logically. However, I kept on making the same mistakes. And when you keep on having difficulties, what do you do? If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A team. Okay, I didn't have the A-team to my disposal. However, I did have Adam Carmichael, mindset and performance coach. But you can see the confusion, right? We talked about some interesting stuff regarding the emotions that came up while playing these hands and in general, why I couldn't think my way out of these situations. I did a session with him and I want to share a couple of clips from that session with you guys. Then what we try to do is we try to use logic to tell that feeling it's wrong and that we should be okay with it. And it doesn't work because when, when you've got this primal unsafe feeling, that unsafeness wants to feel safe, all right? So when you feel unsafe, it's really, really hard to get yourself to do something that is deemed risky by the mind of the body, all right? So mm -hmm. what we need to do is we get very clear what's happening in these moments. What is this unsafe feeling, all right? So 
feelings, I would say feelings need to be felt. All right, so you need to get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm feeling unsafe in this moment. I know this because I'm going to passive lines. I know it's because I can feel like a sense of fear, but what is this unsafe feeling? All right, so I think it'd be really good to go back through all three of the hands that you've sent me because I think they're all really powerful hands. And let's try and get clear on what is it feeling like? So at what moment do you notice something's wrong? What's the signature you're feeling in your body? And what are the early warning signs? All right, so if we go through each of them, I think that will give us a signal of what's going on in your body. And hopefully we can identify a moment where it's like, ah, when I feel these things, that is unsafe. And then we can try, try to see how the mind interacts with that. Uh, but yeah, I think we're really good to, uh, to basically understand how you're feeling in each moment. Uh, mm -hmm. That queen, king queen hands, yeah, the king queen hands. All right, so do you just want to walk me through that hand and when you felt like something, uh, you noticed something was different. All right, so you're playing this hand. It was pretty standard. Yeah, if you just walk me through the hand, it's how, how have you felt during it? There's a couple of factors involved. Pot gets bigger. Mm -hmm. Spot gets more connected. The board gets more connected. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's, a, there's a future threat out there. And mm -hmm. that basically already, I would say, triggers some arousal. Yeah. Um, like both logically, it's a. I think the turn is a uh, is a is a clear check uh, with the king queen. But all, the arousal already kicks in because I'm starting to build a big pot. A bad card comes on the turn, and then basically, yeah. I'm already projecting like, oh, I hope this card doesn't happen. Oh, I hope it's, my mind. I guess I might automatically goes a bit to the future and all the things that could happen. Yeah. Okay, so turn is an eight. Uh, let's say it goes now check check and he overbets. Okay, it's 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 a it's a scenario that can happen. I think it's not going to happen that frequently, but because it can happen in the future and then I'm up for a decision, which, you know, in, in theory is probably just, I feel like we're just going to be close to indifferent if I, if I look at it this way. Yeah. Um, so let's go back. Let's go back to the turn quickly. And you said you noticed maybe some arousal on the turn. So even though, because you know this spot, you should be checking more. You know this pot has the potential to escalate. So tell me if you like how that feels in the body. When you're noticing some form of arousal, is that your heartbeat going faster? Is there a bit of tension in the body? Tell me if you like how that generally feels for you when you're noticing some arousal in the body. Uh, I'm trying to uh, relift the head. Yeah. As I, I feel mainly in my belly, but it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to describe exactly. Um, and then when it actually happened, I feel more in my throat. Okay. Yeah. So the anticipation of it is more in my belly, and then when it actually happened, it becomes more of a of a throat thing. You know, like oh. And then. Yeah. And then, like I said, then when it does happen, like I said, fifty percent of my capacity of thinking logic is already gone. Because it's yeah. like, oh, why does this happen? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is exactly what I didn't want to happen. You know, all these things that are very not 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 useful. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got there like quite a trick, a quick kind of cascade of events. So we've got a feel in the belly, which is generally kind of like knots or tension in the body, in the belly. That's generally fear. That's your body almost like mm -hmm. holding on, going, oh, that's trying to almost like control the situation. In the yeah, throat, exactly. a little bit of a release of that fear, but also like a... Yeah, the throw can be like a lot of different emotions there. And then we've got the mind being active. So uh, talk me through when you notice the mind being active and how is it different? So uh, I know you're a very logical person. You've got a very clear way of thinking in hands. So I'm guessing in these kind of spots, that usual framework of thinking gets a bit disrupted. So talk me through like some no, thoughts. A bit, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone, okay. <laughs> with, with a little bit of luck, uh, you know, one, one, yeah. one piece of logic remains. Uh, <laughs> Okay, like so tell me through some of, the, some of the differences. The differences you notice in the thought processes in these kind of moments. I, you mean the, for example, when I'm not in a downswing and then I'm just playing well, uh, when I have more no, confidence. I, I want to know. I, yeah, I want to know, like in this moment, when when things aren't going oh, good. Okay. I know when things no, are going I, I, I was explaining like the difference basically. Okay. So, yeah, sure. uh, but but let's say, for example, just to keep it in this moment. Um, for example, when he bets the river small. And this is also a trend. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can just call and have mm -hmm. the feeling go away. <laughs> Basically, mm -hmm. means the hand is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if, 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 if I can rush to showdown in a certain way, that's yes. my checking behind or that's just yes. my calling. And then basically the fear is gone or at least, you know, I'm out of that arousal state that the hand has triggered me to be in. I usually go for that option. So here it's just like, okay, if I call, I have no more future headaches. Okay, yeah. that, that's that's just a fact. If I call, the hand is yeah. over. There's no more future headaches, right? But it's not mm. the most plus if you play because the most plus if you play is clearly a race. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think I even wrote it down here that it's analyzing it. It was at least 12 BB or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around, around 12 BB EV. Well, it's, it's quite big. Uh, yeah. But like, I don't see that EV. To be fair, let's say he then does jam and I'm in a state where I make a bad decision. Maybe mm -hmm. the raise is even is even is even up plus V. I don't know. It's it really depends on what you then do in the worst case scenario, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So like I said, then then I try to avoid that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So let's say let's say you were in that moment. Let's say you were able to stay present and you were able to feel that fear in the stomach, but not not in the belly. You're able to mm -hmm. feel that almost like tension in the throat that your opponent puts a bet on the river and you can feel yourself wanting to end the hand now, just get it off with call mm -hmm. and avoid the future scenarios. Let's just say you were to override that in, in game. What is it that you're afraid of? All right. So obviously we can say like him re-raising, getting the money in. What is it about that that feels unsafe? All right. So like, say your opponent puts you in a spot where you're not comfortable and you might make a blunder. You might make a mistake. What is it about being in that kind of spot that creates some sort of fear. What is it you're actually afraid of in those moments? Yeah, like I, said, I would say the two things, like I'm afraid I'm beat and I'm afraid that worst case scenario happens. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because in this, um, in this case, you know, that's why I think this hand is so interesting because you're reopening the action with the race. Yeah. So you are not, you are not, and yeah, it's, it, I would say what if it kind of comes to my mind, mm -hmm. right? What yeah. if, what, what if, yeah. It's I guess I guess the dealing with the uncertainty that the alternative line uh, offers you or gives yes. you. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it all comes down in the long term to being confident to be able to handle these tough spots. Yeah, right? exactly. it's only perfect. There is going to be some mistakes there. So why? Because obviously you played pork for a long time. You're very confident in your game. You can think on the fly. Why do you feel like why why, why for some reason is your body telling you? that if he re-raises, you're going to make a blunder. All right, so let's say you do, you do, do a raise and he does. <laughs> okay, the first, the, first thing, the first thing that comes up, yeah, because you've been blundering all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's like, like I said, it's, it's a series of events when I make bad decisions. Uh, yeah. And, you know, obviously bad decisions is quote, quote. Um, yeah. But it feels like extra bad because never, nothing is working out, right? We're in a, we're in a yeah. downswing. So yeah. our, yeah, like I said, basically the trust in our decisions is is quite yeah. low. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. 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 So, you don't, so why yeah. don't I have trust? Yeah, because the rec yeah, record no, no. is showing that yeah. currently uh, I'm not yeah. making great decisions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, I get it. And it's it's really hard to go, well, just have more trust, have more confidence. Like, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we look at, it, look at the spot, obviously, like, outside the game, it's very easy to make, like, the assessments. We can basically, even, like, say he re-raises. So, say so you raise the river and he jams you all in. Either one of three things. Either he's over-bluffing and call more. He's under-bluffing, fold your range, or he's somewhere balanced. All right? Mm -hmm. Whatever way you want to uh, go for that line, the kind of repercussions of getting that wrong how bad are they? Okay, so let's have a think about it. So I see uh, I mean, you do have quite, a blunder. Quite they're, bad. They're, 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 but like these kind of spots are always potential blunder spots because there's no one in the world that's perfectly yeah. balanced. So everyone is over or under bluffing. Yeah. And now yeah. it's up, up to me to figure out what it is. And yeah. like I said, yeah. let's say, for example, I'm against a guy that's very much outside of uh, uh, population, right? He's clearly right. over passive or he's clearly over aggressive. Mm -hmm. I would say the over passive one is the easiest one. Then you just always yeah. raise. Because if he jams, mm -hmm. your confidence is very high in that spot, so you don't mind getting into the spot. If he's mm -hmm. over aggressive, I would say there's a scenario where I would still call just because mm -hmm. I don't want to call off my stack and have the possibility there that I lose it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, I would say, it's clearly a flaw. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're in a bit of a better state, I've seen myself in these kind of situations be very happy making the race, making a even making like a more thin race, um, yeah. hoping that he jams it in, sort of, right? Yeah, I think that's the the beauty of poker. There's always going to be this seed of doubt, unsure of completely what the line is, and it's yeah. the ability to put yourself in the plus EV line, regardless of like where it could lead to. So uh, yeah, I think for you, it's like 
yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the relative highs and look for, through them. But obviously there's this, this element of not wanting to put yourself in certain situations, not wanting to put yourself in spots, yeah. all coming down to a fear of what could happen in the future. And generally the worst case scenario and your fear is that you'll make a blunder in a worst case scenario when there's lots of chips on the line. I think that that's, that fear has not really come from an accurate place, but fears aren't necessarily accurate and they are very hard to rationalize. So when we have a fear, yeah, yeah, yeah. we can't just use rationale to get rid of it. We've got no, to get I've very already tried that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I think no, the solution, it, it, right? It, it, uh-huh. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go on. The solution is, right, to get very comfortable with what the fears feel like, all right? It's in the yeah. moment being able to sit with a fear, all right? So for you, uh, we've got this feel in the belly, we've got this feel in the throat, and then we've got the mind also being very active. And at the moment, the way you're handling that is you're going for an avoidance strategy or a in the hand here strategy because this feeling you want rid of it the you don't, you don't want to be here and you feel like anything you do that could magnify the feeling that could put you in more situations where the feeling gets worse avoid 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 what we need to get good at is feel in the moment as you're in game and go oh here we go fear oh this means it's an unknown spot which i'm unsure on oh pay attention to how i'm reacting here i'm probably going to go for a passive line here okay can i feel it in the body in, in my the emotion i'm feeling okay it's in the stomach oh I, I don't want to raise here i can notice myself not wanting to raise ah and then could we be in the moment could we be in the feeling and use whatever line we're going to use in that moment so it's it comes back to a point where we need to acknowledge the fear acknowledge that this is a scenario where my body has tagged it as unsafe unsafe yeah. i'm getting this visceral reaction and if i don't watch this reaction i will act very primarily which will protect my feelings and my emotions which will often not be the best moment for me in the moment so we'll go over the other two examples and we'll see if in all the scenarios a similar sort of feeling is starting to come up because then we can get very in touch with how it's feeling we can look at the arousal levels in the body and we can look at how that's impacting you and we come solutions to a uh, center of the body in those moments super stuff the whole session was really useful and helped me better deal with my emotions while playing. After this call, I took things even further and got in touch with a therapist because a lot of the stuff that I was feeling wasn't necessarily new to me. I noticed that throughout my career, I have always been dealing with emotions similar to this. I would always find a way to work around it or to deal with it, but obviously it would be great to understand what is the root cause and try to resolve it from there. So these emotions don't get triggered in certain situations and I don't have to waste energy fighting them. Now talking to a therapist was already on my list for quite some time. However, the necessity never really reached the point to which I would take action. So this was the opportunity to take this necessity, book a session and dig deeper. Because in general, if you find yourself in a situation like in this example, the hand that I played while I was in a downswing and you feel more emotion than rationally speaking, you think you should be feeling at that moment. Usually it's the event that triggers accumulated emotion, which has something to do with a past event that happened in your life. Now I don't have the recording of this session and it would actually be quite useless for you guys as it was in Dutch and Dutch is not really the most common spoken language. But I'll give you guys a quick summary. So I wrote down all the problems that I'm struggling with and one of the points that I wrote down is that throughout my career, especially when I became more successful, I always struggled a little bit with that reality as the way I was grow up, I wasn't really prepared to be very successful. Then when you do suddenly become successful, it's a reality that is not in line with your conditioning that usually leads to something interesting. For example, I was not considered smart when I was younger. I was diagnosed with ADHD and the way I understood that at that moment is that a part of my brain wasn't working. On top of that, throughout my lower school, high school, a lot of teachers would put me separate from the other kids. So you had the kids in the classroom and they put me in a desk next to the teacher, AKA I was being primed with, you are different than the rest, not necessarily in a positive way. And this was if I was even welcome in the class in the first place, okay? Also feedback and recommendations of teachers were usually not very positive. So it wasn't only speech, but also actions that planted this conditioning in my head. And I actually always used my history as a story that I thought was empowering for maybe some of you guys watching. As I would say, listen, 
I wasn't that smart, but I still made it. And reflecting back on that sentence, that's pretty fucked up. Basically, the conditioning from other people was so far in my head that I actually started to believe in it. So the conditioning that I had from when I was little is that basically that I sucked, or as we labeled it in therapy, is that I was a failure. Now everyone has gotten certain conditionings imprinted into them from when they were younger. And these conditionings will usually determine how you feel and act. I actually explained this process as part of our webinar series on how to become a more successful poker player. So if you're interested in that, link it down below. So to link this now to poker, as you're probably thinking, okay, Wacko, Renee, sorry for your youth traumas, but what the fuck does this have to do with the hands that you just showed me? Well, basically, when I start losing or when I'm in a downswing, it's not only the negative feelings that most people have when they're in a downswing, but it's also the accumulated emotion from past events. So basically, if I start losing or get into a downswing or make mistakes, etc., I am a failure. Or at least unconsciously, I feel that. And the more this gets triggered, the harder it becomes to think rationally in a hand because emotions clutter your ability to think rationally. And instead of welcoming these emotions, or as Ben and Babit put it in the Mechanics of Poker podcast, sitting with these emotions, my automatic response is to try to get away from these emotions as soon as possible, which I'm sure sounds familiar because no one likes to feel uncomfortable. And how does that come out in a poker hand? Well, I might just rush through the hand to try to get the showdown, get the hand over with. I might just fold at an earlier street. I might only call instead of raise. I thought the king queen hand is a great example of that. Raising keeps me in that state. Whereas if I just call the hand is over, the emotions go away. This is a great example of how mental game or in this case, even a certain conditioning influence the way I play the hand. Now the solution to this is not study more solvers. I understand that we should obviously raise the river, but at that moment, again, like I said, I wasn't able to think rationally because my mind was cluttered by emotions leading to me taking a suboptimal line. Another thing that I was pointed out in the session that another way I try to avoid getting this feeling is by overly studying, overly preparing for sessions. Basically, I try to do anything in my power in order to not fail or in this case, feel like a failure as these would trigger certain feelings that I'm trying to avoid from when I was younger. Now, obviously, this also has some positive attributes, right? making sure you prepare well, making sure you study a lot. However, it's the excessive or the overly in that sentence that is the problem. And I think this has cost me quite some volume throughout my poker career. I would say volume has always been a leak of mine throughout my whole career. And I now have a better understanding of why that is. Now I hope that by breaking this down and sharing my story, you start to realize why mental game can be so important. Now, this is obviously not the case for everyone as the degree in which mental game influences your performance varies per person. But do check for yourself if anything that I just said sounds relatable to you. We made good progress in volume 20K hands, which puts us right at our target. We made good progress in mental game. And I was really happy with how my stats looked over the last two months of playing. So all around, I'm a happy guy. Content wise for Poker Ambition, as I said, we changed some things up. We rolled that out. We made some watch your move clips on Instagram. We made play and explain videos and we've done more podcasts. So subscribe to the channel to not miss out on those. I'm going to spend the rest of this week when this video came out working on the masterclass of facing a three bet while you're out of position, which should be released in a couple of weeks. The main point for improvement is to get less overwhelmed and be more welcoming for the emotions that come up around losing. Mainly doing this by accepting the emotions as Adam explained in our coaching session. I should also be on the lookout for certain behavior which is related to extensively doing something in order to avoid these emotions around failing. Technically, an improvement point that I want to work on for the next two months is spot when I play strong hands especially, but in general when I start to play too tricky and a bit too fancy. And it's basically the same procedure. I'm going to try to identify the mistakes from a theoretical perspective 
by marking hands and reviewing them in solvers. And then the mistakes that keep on occurring, even though I rationally understand why, for example, a solver doesn't want to do that. I will dive into a mental hand history and try to look at the flaw and maybe do another session with Adam to really dig into the root cause, which leads me to want to play tricky. Because to me, it feels more rewarding when I get a stack in in a way that I sort of deserve the money. I induced a bluff, right? Or when there is a low frequency play that I can spot. So these are clearly flaws. I mean, when I'm saying this out loud, I know it's pretty flawed, but apparently I have a desire to win money that way. Whereas just stacking someone in a normal way, you know, a line that basically anyone would just take with a strong hand. Okay, I have a strong hand. Let's go, bam, 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 get the money in. That I think then feels less rewarding for me. But like I said, over the next two months, I wanna dig a little bit deeper, gather more hands and dig into my thought processes to see where the flaw is and try to fix it. Now in this upcoming month, I will have less time as I will go on a small snowboard trip with the family. And at the end of March, I'll be going to Brazil for two weeks. So most probably the next update will be two months from now. So let's see if we manage to improve in the areas we listed. So overall, lots of stuff to be excited for. I'm really looking forward to make continuous progress. And I'm curious what you guys are going to be working on. Tell me, how did your month go? What went well? What could have gone better? What are you trying to improve for the upcoming month? Leave a comment down below. Make sure to like the video if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel. And I wish you all the best of luck at the tables.